be so somber. <laughs> <laughs> the fun of it. All right, let me thank everybody for coming. Um, and thank you for all overcoming the weather and the roads. Um, actually, of all the things that I do during the year, this is kind of one of the fun things. And, uh, I should tell every parent and family member here that you should be very proud of these young people. Um, this year we had over, I think, uh, somewhere around 600 essays submitted. I think for about 54 schools. What was it Katarina, 54 schools? 42 schools. Uh, that was close. Uh, 42 <laughs> schools. <laughs> Um, and the quality of these essays is really, really extraordinary. And it's not just the writing, and, and by the way, the, these essays were judged not by my office. We wanted to separate my views from um, what the kids were writing. I think we have seven teachers independently, absolutely independently of our office. And two of them are here today. Oh, where are the two teachers? We've got Jason and Brad. Please, man. Okay. Thank you very much. And, they, and they uh, judge the essays not by the politics or the views as much as the um, uh, writing ability and the laying out of ideas and the critical thinking. That was the judgment, not, not one's conclusions. People are entitled to their views. Um, and what impressed me in reading the, in the way we did it is um, we, we selected the top 20, and I think probably most of them are here today. Um, and what really impressed me is the wide range of subject matter that the young people um, wrote about. Not only the quality of the writing, which was really good, but the, um, the, the subjects that they chose to write about. So, um, Without uh, further ado, what I would like to do this morning is that each and every one of you speak briefly about your essay, why you wrote it, what was in it. And then we'll have discussion. Uh, I want everybody to participate, nobody to be nervous about it. It's an informal thing. Uh, and we'll, we'll keep moving. Um, we don't have a lot of time to spend on 20 essays, but let's, uh, I'll jump in and, and you guys as well comment on each other's uh, essay. All right, the winner who is uh, seated here to my left is um, uh, Marjorie Parker. Marjorie, you like to be called Maggie, right? Yeah. Okay. So jump in and tell us very briefly uh, what you wrote about and why you think it's important. Okay. Uh, so I wrote about uh, LGBT, uh, preventing LGBT hate crimes and employment discrimination and things like that. The reason I wrote about these issues was because um, in my school I'm part of the QSA, which is the Queer Straight Alliance, and from being in that for two years, I've really, it's really impacted me to see the issues, the broad ranges of issues that LGBT people face on a daily basis. So it really hit home with me, and uh, it's the thing that I think I could write about the most passionately, so that's why I chose that topic. Great, thank you. Uh, comments, LGBT discrimination, opportunities. Is that an issue? Right, who wants to comment on that? Issue, not an issue? Now don't be shy, guys. <laughs> Problem, I know you're all smart. So all right, who wants to talk about that? Discrimination, a problem in America? Has it historically been a problem? Who wants to comment on that? All right, come on. Well, um... Give, give us your... All right, who's that? Maisie? Maisie, yes. Um, I am also part of the QSA at my school, and... And your school is? Middlebury. Okay. And what, um, I mean, it's not just in the workplace, right? Like, we see discrimination even starting from elementary school, and it carries, and it even worsens as uh, people grow up. And uh, I've had friends who've experienced like really awful, um, I mean, bullying based on their uh, sexual identity and gender identities, and I mean, maybe I 
it's definitely an issue and there's so much that we can do that I don't think we are doing. Who wants to give us a history? You know, sometimes in the textbooks, people are all America's a free society, everything was wonderful. Give me a brief rundown of discrimination in American history. Who wants to take a shot at that one? <laughs> has, everybody, has everybody always been treated equally? Right, who wants to give me a brief rundown? What was the status of women when this country was first formed? Women voted and ran for office and all that stuff. You see a lot of women up here on the walls. These are former governors or so obviously, um, I'm all of us at Hanover High School. Uh, obviously, in the early days of the Republic, women had extremely limited um, political influence, and they couldn't vote. Uh, at least in some states, it varied state by state. And uh, women didn't really become enfranchised until uh, the early uh, 20th century. Um, I think one of the biggest things in the history of women becoming uh, more involved in politics is when Jeanette Rankin, the first woman elected to the House of Representatives, uh, won her seat in 1917. And then uh, shortly after that, she pushed a uh, something that came before, sort of an inspiration for the amendment that would eventually allow women to vote. And uh, she's, I think, one of my heroes and should be very good. Remember. Not well known, but you're right. She is an American hero. All right, but it's not just women. What else? Um, can I speak? I mentioned last night an interesting story. I read a PhD thesis, I think written in the 30s at UVM. And if my memory is correct, this is what it said, believe it or not. In Burlington, uh, the only people who worked in banks were Protestants. And it was a big deal when a Catholic got a job in a bank. Talk about the 1930s, maybe. What about that? What about Italians, Irish, Jews? Who wants to say a little bit of word? So I'm getting back, we started with LGBT, but this is a long history. Anybody else want to talk, think about that? Native Americans, what about Native Americans? <coughs> they always been treated decently and warmly and? Well, um, I know that um, as I look back, uh, I remember the, um, I think it was the Trail of Tears yep. um, that President, this, the seventh President, Andrew Jackson, um, forced the um, a certain native tribes in Georgia to flee to western parts of our country. And of course, that just is such a terrible aspect of our history that, um, and of course, discrimination is still prominent today. However, as we look back, we see examples of um, our presidents and our, our nation's leaders that are um, like in the open discriminating against uh, people that really own this, this land and uh, harvested and lived here and had history here before us uh, because of course America right now is the land of the immigrants. So um, as, as I look back on that, I just, um, I hate to see the fact that we had to uh, discriminate and uh, and segregate ourselves from um, Indian tribes uh, when we could have tried to support their um, prosperity instead of just sort of shunning them from our country. Okay, I want to move on, but the only point that I want to make here is this country, in this country, all of us have an enormous amount to be proud of. My father came here at the age of 17 without any money and he became, you know, was able to raise his kids. And that's the story of many millions of families. So there's a lot that we can be proud of. But you should also try to take an objective look at our history. Not everything, sometimes people write books, everything is wonderful, everything is great. Not true. It's not true for any country. Not true for any country. Yesterday, last night, I had a town meeting in Burlington with the German ambassador. And they're doing great things now. Needless to say, their history has been, to say the least, very blighted. So take an objective look. And discrimination is one of the aspects of our history that has existed. And that we should understand it and do our best to go beyond it and create a nation where we treat all people uh, with the dignity that they deserve as human beings. Okay, so Maggie, thank you very much for your work. Um, Laura Rich uh, got the second place of award, and Laura's from uh, St. John's Bury Academy. Laura, what'd you write about? 
I wrote about the need to decrease the opportunity gap for first generation and low income students um, um, on their path to higher education. And uh, that was a topic that I chose because I'm a member of Upward Bound, which is a federally funded TRIO program. Um, it was started, I believe, after the Great Depression by um, Lyndon B. Johnson. And um, that program has definitely influenced my, my, the course of my higher education, my path to higher education. And I think that I wouldn't be who I am today without it. And so I think that we need to make higher education free. And I think that, that is something that would definitely influence people like me. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Laura. That is a very, very important issue. As I mentioned last night, I met with the uh, German ambassador public college in, in Germany is free, uh, as is the case in a number of countries around the world. Why is that important? Is a law right? Is that a good idea? Or should we hold the view that you, know, you can afford to go to college, go to college. You can't afford, tough luck. It's another way of looking at it. I mean, not everybody owns a big car or a big house. Why should everybody be able to go to college? Uh, Zoe, where are you from? I'm from CVU. I want you get that mic, get Zoe that mic over there if you could. We'll embarrass her even more. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, I was just thinking about the fact that I think everyone should have equal opportunities for education, and it's if you sell it as an investment in the next workforce, next generation, I think everyone would be really pleased by that idea. Um, and I just think that the next generation would have better opportunities to improve upon what the previous generation did. If right. Zoe were. makes a very good point. She talks about um, an investment into the future. Let me make it more personal. Uh, if you don't get a higher education in today's economy, in most cases, uh, how are you going to do? Let's say you graduate high school and you don't go on. We drop out of high school, you think you're going to do particularly well economically? Who wants to comment on that? Well, let me get new hands. I'd like everybody involved. Anyone here? Yeah. Tell us who you are and grab that mic there. Right. <clears throat> I'm Justin Gulli. I'm also from Champlain Valley Union High School in Wilkins, CBU. And it's over the course of the past few decades, and this was not always the case. I, in many, not all, but in many fields, it's become quite difficult to secure advancement in a given career without higher education, simply because many jobs have become more technical as less technical jobs are automated, which means it's more important to provide funds not just for colleges, but also for technical training and retraining of workers. That's exactly right. Most of the new jobs being created require a level of technological skill that certainly wasn't the case uh, 20 years ago. And you need additional training um, and uh, higher education for that. What about the um, more philosophical point of view that Laura, I think, touches on? I think what you're saying, Laura, is you think that everybody, regardless of the income of their families, should have the opportunity to get a higher education. Is, do you want to yeah, I just think that um, it shouldn't matter where you come from or what um, your family makes for an income. <coughs> if you are smart enough and if you work hard enough, you should be able to um, go to college and you should be able to do the same things that maybe people with more um, money can do. And I don't think that that should be a barrier for anybody. Okay. I agree with Laura very strongly. We are working hard to try to make public colleges and universities tuition free. We're having some success around the country, we're beginning to move in that direction. But now I want to play the devil's advocate. Uh, who wants to argue against a lawyer? Because when you talk about free tuition at public colleges and universities, it's not free. Somebody is paying for it. It's going to be the taxpayers who are paying for it. So who wants to argue? Either whether you believe it or you just want to make the argument, will argue the other point of view as to why should, so somebody doesn't have a lot of money, why should somebody else have to pay for that person to go to college through higher taxes? And I 
idea that I'll give it a whole lot in Washington. So what's the, what's the argument on that? Is there any validity in that? Who wants to make that point or will contradict that point? So if I say to you, look, I'm sorry you don't have a lot of money, but why do I want to pay more in taxes? I got to worry about my problems with my family. Why should I pay for you to go to college? What's the argument against that? Laura, you want to make the argument? All right, so the question is, okay, you make a good point. Be nice to everybody. Everybody can go to college. How are you going to pay for that? I mean, like you said, the taxpayers pay for that. Um, I don't know how to argue against no, my own point. Yes. <laughs> um, I mean, the there's definitely, like, wealth disparity in our country, and so, like, the richer people obviously are going to want to keep their own money. Um, but, see, I'm saying but because I want to. No, you're doing good. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's obvious why, why should, like, the people that argue that college shouldn't be free and you shouldn't have to pay for other people's education, like, I, their point is valid. Why should you have to spend your own money on somebody else's education? But, <coughs> I just, I think that it's for a bigger, it's a bigger picture. Um, it's for our economy, it's for the state of our, our nation. I think that's lots of the answer. Yeah, uh, Lily. Yeah, I was just gonna go off of that. Um, I think a lot of the reasons why people are against the free college is that a lot of people in America are lower income and are already having a hard time paying for things bes like besides paying for other people's college. So, and I think a lot of people think very short term about financial stuff. So in the long run, investing in um, education for young people is definitely economically a better option. But since people don't have the money to pay the taxes, it's really hard to sell it because in the short term, it seems like they're just going to not have the money that they have worked hard to earn. Okay, good. Let's move on. Uh, which takes us to Alva. Uh, where's Alva? Okay, and Alva actually begins to touch on this. You're dealing with... Uh, income and wealth inequality and so forth? Why don't you yeah. say a few words? So I don't mind about income and wealth inequality, not only because I believe, uh, as the Senator said many times, it's a great moral issue uh, that in the richest nation in the world, so few have so much and so many have so little. But I actually think um, that there's an issue here where we come to, it, things begin to break down, institutions grow weaker, uh, when uh, people feel that their livelihood, their future prosperity, their children's future is under serious threat. So I think um, we all have an interest in creating, as I said, a more stable and sustainable path for our economy because honestly, I, I don't think we can go on the path we're on right now. I think you're going to see more Occupy Wall Street. I think you're going to see more civil unrest, which I'm not advocating, but I think it's something that I think it, this should be a bipartisan issue, trying to make it so that people have more money in their pockets, try and make it so our institutions are strong and our society is strong. Okay. Um, okay, more discussion. Oliver is concerned about the, what is in fact a very significant disparity in income and wealth. It's not talked about a whole lot. But if you have three people in this country who own more wealth than about half of America, 160 million, three people here, 160 million people over here. Is that a moral issue? Is that an economic issue? How do you frame that issue? Is it an important issue? Or is it an issue where some would say, hey, yeah, that's right, so what? Maybe I'll be the fourth. Uh, let me get some more hands here. I want everybody, guys, don't be nervous. I like your views. Anybody else want to, who wants to comment on this? I can talk. Okay. I think it just like bring, bring that mic a little bit closer if you could. I think it like goes back to the last issue. I think like those like the people who have the money should help the people who don't have the money. So like that goes back to like raising the minimum wage or like paying for colleges and just like helping these people get the jobs that they need to provide for their families so that they can grow economically. See, this is a very very tough issue. It's an issue I get involved in a lot, but it's it's an issue that people feel uncomfortable talking about. Actually, it's an issue that people feel more uncomfortable talking about than gay rights, as a matter of fact. 
touches things very, very deeply. Um, right now, you have, now I'm talking about my politics, which doesn't have to be yours, but we're coming up to an election in 2018 where one family and a few other billionaire families, who knows what the Koch brothers are, anyone know who the Koch brothers are? They're the second wealthiest family in America, they're worth about 90 billion. And they and a few of them, and I mean a few, smaller than the number of people in this room, will spend $400 million on this coming election. $400 million to protect their interests. Um, what's that about? What do we think about that? And, and it, it gets back to Oliver's discussion. Uh, they are the second wealthiest family in, in, in the country. And uh, they apparently want more. How do, you, how do you frame that in your own minds? So when you say about people on top should help, that's not their view. They have a very different view. What is their view? What is the opposite view of an, an America? Yeah, uh, okay, a little bit. Um, I think their point of view is that we're a capitalistic society, so every man should be able to earn as much money as they want. But the problem is, is when you have such a huge population that isn't able to do that, you have to stop and say, what's stopping them from doing that? And I think it's like the complexity of the jobs, and then you need the education to get those jobs. But the people that already have that money, it's a lot easier for them to do that, and they don't want to be told that they can't. Uh, very good, Lillian. I think you did a good job. I think that's uh, essentially what they believe. They believe is, you know, it's kind of uh, every person for themselves. We have done well. You have the opportunity to do well. If you're poor or if you're working class and you can't afford college and you can't afford health care, sorry, but it's, <coughs> it's a society in which each person goes forward on their own and should not expect uh, society to, to help them. Now that is, by the way, a very, very different vision that exists in most other industrialized countries. One of the things we try to do, uh, for better or worse, is try to explain that countries around the world guarantee health care to all people, make sure that college is affordable for all people, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a philosophical vision which now is very prevalent in the United States. That view now is the ascendant view. It is the view of the Republican Party, and to a significant degree, the, the view of the president. Um, so, this issue is uh, enormously important, um, and it's one that has to be debated and thought about. All right, uh, Bailey Blow is from South Burlington. Uh, Bailey? Yes, so. Um, grab, my grab that mic right in front of you. Um, my topic was about climate change, and I chose this topic because I believe it's one of, if not the most pressing issue we have in our country today, and not only our country, but the rest of the world, because it's affecting all of us, and we see it worsening and worsening every day, as we have like the ocean becoming more acidic, and we have natural disasters becoming more intense, as in like Hurricane Harvey and Hurricane Maria that we saw these past couple months, and I believe we need to start doing more to help reverse climate change because we have to protect the only place we have to live. Okay, excellent. Uh, I um, agree with, with Bailey. There are people who disagree. What's the other side of the story? President of the United States, what do you say to Bailey? It's a Chinese hoax. <laughs> <laughs> most from the climate denialist crowd, uh, besides the, that one in the Scott who why, why don't you want to live in Florida? It's so nice in Florida. But the argument I've heard is, should we be sacrificing economic prosperity to appease some fringe tree hugger environmentalists? So what, the temperature goes up two okay. degrees, and if it gets in the way of profits, it's a pretty hard sell to the business community. Okay, that's good. And the other argument is that it's just scientifically not true. They will try out scientists who will, who will deny it. Um, and I know a couple of you have written on, uh, Bailey is not the only one, so let's spend a minute on, on climate change. Uh, why is, is Bailey right? Is it in fact true or is the president right that it's not man-made? 
Uh, Lily? I also wrote my essay about uh, climate change. I wrote mostly about this, the rising CO2 levels. Um, we've sort of already hit the ceiling that we can hit for CO2, and we've definitely passed it by now, and it's not going down anytime soon. Uh, I agree with uh, her point because if we keep going up at the rate we're going up, we're going to see a lot of really detrimental changes that we're probably not going to be able to survive through if we don't start doing something about it. And hearing uh, people in the current administration say that it's not economically sustainable to start investing and fixing it, it kind of just blows my mind because it's like, if we don't do this, we're not going. We're not. We're not going to be the ones to survive this. The Earth is going to be fine, but we're going to be gone. So. Okay. Justin Hassan, there was a budget passed the other day, which included in it, I can't remember the exact amount, maybe 70, 80 billion dollars for disaster relief of Texas, Florida, Puerto Rico, and the Virgin Islands, which many people think the severity of that storm, that climate change contributed to. It. Okay, Bailey, thanks very much for that essay. Uh, Mason Castle uh, is at St. Johnsbury Academy. Mason, what did you write about? I wrote about gerrymandering. And okay, hold that mic and get close to it. The reason I want you to hold the mic is we're, um, we're taping this. We are videoing it for our office, so we'll probably get an album. So we want people to hear you. Okay. So I wrote about gerrymandering. This has become a lot more prevalent in recent elections. Um, there's a Supreme Court case right now uh, in Wisconsin, I believe, because the districts are so violently gerrymandered that it's impossible for uh, the opposing party to get victories in those districts. And this is important because, um, you know, in a democracy, it's important that everyone has a voice. And this is a, a more, a frankly, more effective method of voter suppression. Okay. Who knows what gerrymandering is? Who wants to discuss it? Want to say a word about it? Uh, sure. Your name is? My name is Ella. I'm yeah. from Champlain Valley as well. Um, I think this is definitely another issue that um, is causing a lot of problems in our country because being founded upon um, sharing each other's ideas and viewpoints as a democracy, it's important that everyone's opinions and views are shared equally, and it's hard to do so in a voting system where it's possible to almost rig the system that your voice doesn't get heard. And I feel as coming of the voting age that um, that really almost scares me that my opinion couldn't be represented in an equal way when I vote. Well, Mason, you're touching on an important issue, which um, certainly includes gerrymandering and courts are beginning to look at that. But it goes beyond gerrymandering. What other aspects of voter suppression making it hard for people to vote are we seeing in recent years? Yes, uh, well, there's been um, the legislation with voter ID laws, which is um, you know a pretty direct like way of making it harder for you know minorities to vote and you know, <coughs> having their voice be heard. What's been interesting is um, we're seeing two trends in America: one making it harder for people to vote. Uh, and one making it easier for people to vote. Vermont, we're drawing a number of other states which actually make it easier for people to participate in the political process. What's the ulterior goal of keeping people from voting? Who has thoughts about it? Yep. Well, uh, hold that mic again. Push that mic. Gerrymandering and also voter ID laws are really specifically meant to make sure certain demographics, which are more inclined to vote for certain political parties don't get voted, so that way the, po the party in power can essentially write laws and write lines on the map that will ensure that they remain in power, but that undermines so, the principle. Uh, is gerrymandering a new idea? No. Uh, I, you, I want to get more voices. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, gerrymandering is a new idea. <laughs> Been around since around the 1800s, which is how from a guy named Mr. Jerry. Right? Yes, which is how it um, got its name. And I know that voter suppression continues to take on new forms as technology develops, and it's just a way, usually, to enforce the system that um, so marginalizes people of color and people of certain identities. So. 
Good. Okay. That's a very, very important issue. Uh, I'm going to mispronounce this name. Be Yada Dahl in the Winooski High School. Could you help me out with the pronunciation? Vzata. Okay. So I wrote about immigration. Um, first, I talked about the immigration ban that occurred a few months ago. Hold that mic a little bit closer. There you go. So first, I talked. Can you hear me? Uh, First, I talked about the immigration ban that occurred a few months ago when Trump banned seven predominantly Muslim countries from inter entering the United States just because of their religion. And my solution was this, um, to this was instead of banning in innocent human beings who are looking for a home, um, was to make the background checks more efficient. And then I talked about the 11 million un undocumented immigrants. Uh, these undocumented immigrants come here for a better life, and they work jobs that Americans don't even cons consider like picking apples in 92 degree. And they're paid below or minimum wage and they have limited rights and and they have limited right, rights and they pay taxes and their only fault is being is their in immigration status. And for that I think they should res the US would create a path for citizenship for these people so that they receive the same opportunities as illegal immigrants. And, and finally, I talked about the dreamers. Uh, the dreamers are the children of the undocumented immigrants who came here as children. The dreamers are young adults like us and kids like our younger siblings. And while we look forward to our graduation and our first year of college, these dreamers had to live in fear of be being deported. And I think they should also be given the opportunity to become citizens of the United States so that they can live freely like us. Thank you very much. Um, discussion. This is a very, very big issue in the United States. It's one of Trump's big issues. It is an issue throughout the world. In Germany, a very anti-immigrant party received 12% of the vote uh, in their recent elections. That's true all over the world. All right, what's going on? What is the solution? What is actually going on in Congress? I'll be on a plane on Monday. What's going to be going on in the Senate? I'm not getting one now, Zoe. Um, well, I know that the new the the new proposed budget probably has some provisions for citizenship for citizenship for dreamers, and I was wondering, like, do you know what those new provisions are? Well, it doesn't, uh, and that's been one of the, the key debates. Uh, without getting into the rules of the Senate and all kinds of complicated stuff, the budget does not have anything to do with the dreamers. That will be coming. What has happened is that the um, leader of the Senate, Senator McConnell from Kentucky, has promised literally this week that there will be a debate and a vote uh, on immigration legislation. And he says it will be a fair debate, so there will be amendments being offered. And uh, the amendment to win will need 60 votes. Um, and right now, we think we have about 56 or 57 votes uh, to support uh, uh, a bill protecting the dreamers. But um, we'll see what happens during the week. Um, and in the House, there is a majority, which is all they need in the House. But the uh, Speaker of the House, Mr. Wayne, is choosing not to allow that bill at this moment to come up. And if some of you may have read, Nancy Pelosi was on the floor of the House for eight hours. That was exactly the issue she was talking about. All right, but well, let's, we've got a little bit to talk about immigration. What about dreamers? Uh, let me get some new voices here. Any thoughts on that? If you were a member of the Senate, what would you be doing in terms of dreamers legislation? Yeah, Lily? Um, so I think one of the bigger issues or misconceptions that people have about the Dreamers is that they think that they uh, don't pay taxes and that we're paying for them, but uh, Dreamers are provided with social security numbers and they do pay taxes and they've pretty much been in the U.S. their whole life. Like, this is their country. The other, like, where they came from, they don't consider that their home because they've been here the majority of their life. So I think a lot of people see them as, like, a threat or a burden when they're really They've been here almost as long as the rest of us, some of them. So it just seems a little crazy to think that we're treating them as separate. Okay. 
Well, thank you very much. Um, Paige Greenia. Oh, skipped over. Oh, skipped did over William. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, oh, I'm sorry. All right. Um, uh, Lillian Casio, is that how you pronounce it? Mm -hmm. Uh, Lillian, I'm sorry, we skipped you. Uh, and Lillian is at the uh, CV. Um, so I wrote my essay on the opioid epidemic and the two possible solutions being placing more stringent rules on pharmaceutical companies as well as providing supervised injection sites. And I picked this topic because I think increasingly in our local communities we're seeing the effects of the opioid epidemic as well as at the national level. And I think it's one of the most urgent things that we need to address just because of the rapid rate that people are dying at. Okay. Uh, again, you, you guys are absolutely right. This is a huge, huge issue. All right, let me ask a personal question. Have you, or do you know anybody who has been impacted by the opioid uh, epidemic? Anybody know people? Well, thanks. Who wants to speak to that? Caitlin, do you want to say a word on that? Do you know anybody? Yeah, you don't have to tell us names or anything, but just put your, hold that mic closely, please. So uh, he's not a direct family member, but he's related to part of my family, and he's been dealing with this for like over 20 years, basically, and he's at the point where he's living in his mom's attic and he can't walk, like his legs are purple and he he's gonna die, and it's, it's really um, taking a toll on our whole family on like, what we can do to help him because it's pretty much past the point of he, he can't get better at this point. Okay, thank you for sharing. Other personal experiences with uh, people who are, anybody else want? Okay, this is um, an epidemic that is sweeping the country. In Vermont, I don't remember the exact number, but over 100 people here died last year <clears throat> as a result of overdoses. Um, why are people, why do people use um, Oxycontin or other opioids? Anyone have a thought? William, you want to take a shot at that? Um, well, I think the problem starts with pharmacies that are prescribing these drugs when they're not needed, and then eventually people become hooked on them and then they can't afford them. So they turn to street drugs like heroin, which is so potent and dangerous to overdose on, and then they follow that path. Um, in America, last year, life expectancy actually went down. <coughs> and that's very, very unusual, because life expectancy usually goes up. And one of the reasons was drug overdoses and alcohol-related deaths and suicide. So we've got a real problem here, and you're right, it's an issue uh, that has got to be addressed. So let me be a little bit paternalistic and just make sure that all of you guys know the point that Lillian made, is this is very, very potent stuff, and you can't, sometimes you just can't take a few pills. You got hooked on these things. You need more and more. And uh, so stay away from it. That stuff and make sure your friends do as well. Um, Paige Greenio, is it the Sisquoi Valley Union? Um, Paige, what's your right now? Um, so, my topic similarly was about decriminalization and legalization of marijuana. And the points that I made were that if it could be decriminalized and regulated by the government, it would be safer for anyone who chooses to use it because the reality is. People are going to use it, no matter if it's legal or not. They do, and they always will. Um, and <coughs> excuse me. Um, if it was legalized, um, it has the potential to save the government a lot of money um, in the ways that we hold a lot of nonviolent drug offense offenders um, in state prisons, and that costs the government lots and lots of money when it, I mean, it's, what they're doing is illegal, but it's not necessarily detrimental to have them free. Okay. 
Hey, Jay, you're aware of what the folks in this building did a few weeks ago. What, what did they do? They passed the law. Yeah. They listened to you, right? <laughs> okay. People agree with the page, disagree with the page. They get more. Mason, you got a thought on that? Yeah, I mean, I think having a government controlling the supply, having government control supply um, makes it a lot safer, especially having um, it gone through, like, you know, FDA regulation. Yeah, FDA, like, regulation and not having, like, people on the street selling it makes it safer for consumption as well. Okay. Well, those words, yep. I know that there's a worry that teenagers and minors will use drugs or use marijuana if it's legalized or increasingly becomes um, legalized throughout the nation, but I know that in Colorado, um, teen marijuana usage actually went down and decreased after it was legalized, so that's just an interesting fact about Okay. Okay. Lily? Um, yeah, also I just wanted to add on to that. You're talking about how we would be spending less money um, having to have all these people in jail, and we can use that money to address drugs that are actually causing more harm than marijuana <coughs> because I don't, I believe there hasn't been a single overdose death from marijuana usage, and I think that just it doesn't require people having to go to jail for it because it doesn't, it's not as dangerous basically as all these other drugs that need more attention. All right, I won't tell your parents, but um, <laughs> do you know, is marijuana fairly prevalent in your schools? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, um, this whole issue of the drug, the war on drugs is again, I mean, that's why I like your essays because you keep touching on the major, some of the major issues that we're dealing with as a country. Um, marijuana is now listed in Schedule One of the Controlled Substance Act right alongside of heroin, which I think makes very little sense. Anybody you could argue the pluses and minuses of marijuana, but nobody really thinks it's heroin. And I think, uh, to Paige's point, um, a lot of lives have been destroyed, not because so many people go to jail, per se for marijuana, but you get a criminal record. And if you get a criminal record, it becomes harder to get a job, harder to get a job, and your life is in a downward spiral. So, um, Paige, thanks very much for raising that important issue. Uh, Caitlin uh, Little at Lewski High. Caitlin, what did you write about? I wrote about- okay, Hold that mic closely. Sexism in America. What? Sexism in America. Okay. And uh, I wanted to focus on that because it only recently kind of hit me how large of an issue it actually is, and that's just from personal experiences and not really, um, I mean, I, I am definitely paying attention more because of all the uh, accusations that are coming out in the media, and but that's only making me realize that it's not just the entertainment business, it's everywhere, and I didn't think it was that big of an issue anymore until I got older, and I realized that just like even I will think women are less because of who they are, and it's 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 odd. I'm not sure what like how this happens to people who grow up around that, but yeah. So I just wanted to touch on that so that people can understand what women actually have to face in their everyday lives, so that we can be more aware of it, really. Okay, very, very, very important mission. Who wants to jump in on that? Kate Ryan, is she wrong? Yep. Um, well, I think what makes, uh, what is making people realize more and more the um, extent to which sexism has affected the way our country is um, <coughs> directed and sort of um, the way laws are passed and the way women are represented in government is the representation of women in the media. And um, in even in literature, uh, like, I mean, with all these allegations of sexual harassment, you see people returning to books like The Handmaid's Tale and looking into sort of the way women have been depicted throughout history and um, it makes it look like this entire situation was ultimately inevitable, which is 
terrifying and uh, humbling almost because you have all of these perspectives culminating in terrifying um, and ultimately uh, detrimental um, I mean, events in society. Um, Caitlin, you, you even write about um, women being dissatisfied with their appearance that somebody else has to define what somebody's supposed to look like. Say a word on that. Um, so this started back in the early 20th century when um, men started drawing women and they drew them how they thought that they would, you know, how they thought that they should look like. And that was kind of the start of the photoshopping and like even before that was a thing. And so every picture, if it's not said to not be uh, photoshopped, and it probably is just from small detailing and making them look better because people are just obsessed with how women look and it's, it's and men too, but it's really prominent um, for females. And it's hurting women because they're, all they're seeing is one type of body type and they can't fathom that they can be beautiful just by what they look like themselves. <coughs> Further discussion on that. Oh, um, I have a point on this. So, um, <clears throat> so I think um, societal standards have grown to the point where people think they must form themselves into what the like the models look like in the magazines or what um, what people see in the media or in the news or in the entertainment business, especially for like celebrities or actresses or actors. Uh, so people look at that as like a source of inspiration, but I think really people should learn to be more satisfied um, with the way they are because I mean everyone has their niche. Um, it doesn't have to be. Uh, it doesn't really have to be necessarily an appearance. It, it can be uh, intelligence. It can be athleticism. People don't have to to become other people because you were born the way uh, you, you were born with your own like identity, your own personality and your own strengths and weaknesses. Um, I recently read uh, a poem, in, or actually it's a short story in my English class. It's known as Fairness. Um, it sort of delves into the fact that not only do we have this societal problem in America, but uh, there are little girls in Nigeria as well that are looking at our cosmopolitan magazines and are trying to bleach their skin to become what people are in America. and. This Let me jump in, I, and this is, a, again, an issue, the problem with this discussion is all of you are raising issues that have been going on for hours on each one. Let me just divert a little bit. Uh, Caitlin writes about um, people being made conscious of how they, they look and, and women being told to look in a different way. What about the ads that tell you you're not cool if you don't have a $200 pair of sneakers? Does that relate to that at all? Is that part of it? I mean, is somebody cool because they have an expensive pair of blue jeans or, yeah? I think it ties back to consumerism in America and how companies can profit off of um, perpetuating um, certain standards. And I think that this affects LGBTQ people and people of color and people with disabilities as well. And I think that certain standards are what sells in America. And um, like you mentioned, $200 sneakers are, um, potentially profit. And it's pertinent and prevalent and rampant in, in advertising specifically. Is somebody cool in your high school if they have it on? You'll forgive me, I don't know what the latest blue jean <laughs> cool thing is, or a pair of sneakers. Is somebody cool if they have the latest expensive pair of blue jeans or pair of sneakers? What does that mean, Paige? Have you ever thought of that? Um. I have a thought about something else that she addressed. Okay. I just want to bring up the point that it goes both ways too. It goes for men also. For example, if you have like, let's just say a male teacher, parents are automatically a little bit, whether they admit it or not, a little bit uncomfortable, say if it's like a preschool teacher, because you expect that role to be filled by a woman. So I just want to bring up that it goes both Very ways. Good. Very good. And one of the things which I think is positive is that we are breaking down, used to be nursing, 
for example, is almost exclusively uh, female. That's changing. And it is important to my mind that we break through uh, those barriers that uh, men understand that working uh, as a nurse or uh, in preschool is, is very important work as well. Okay, again, this is a subject we can go on for a long time, but we don't have the time. Thank you. Bring up my So I decided that I was also going to write about climate change because I think a lot of people underestimate the scale of its impact because it's not just a local issue, it's not just an environmental issue or a national issue. This affects everyone and every country on every continent in ways that many people don't even realize. For example, food. Food becomes more expensive because it becomes more difficult to produce. Even shipping becomes more expensive because climate change contributes to piracy. There, there are just so many ways that it's, it has an enormous impact on all of us. That's a very, very good point. And I mean, it's not written, you know, people will say, well, here's a hurricane. <laughs> Climate change may have contributed to that. People see that, or they see drought, or they see uh, rising sea levels. But what they don't see, for example, is in the terrible, terrible, terrible horrors that are taking place in Syria, that climate change contributes because people left the rural area to go into the cities, and that caused all kinds of problems and migrations of people, and so forth. So that is, uh, Duncan, a very, very significant issue. And to look at the broad implications of climate change and where it's going to take this planet in the next 20 or 30 years is something that we've got to study uh, very significantly. Uh, Jake uh, McNeil, is it Milton? Jake? Yeah, so I uh, wrote about uh, education, more specifically the impact of teacher strikes on the education of future generations. Um, I feel like this is very prevalent, especially in Vermont, with like the recent teacher strikes in uh, Burlington and South Burlington. I feel like in order to like solve these issues, we need to open the door to productivity uh, and let teachers air their grievances. And uh, I feel like school boards need to focus their resources more on solving these issues. Okay. Um, is teaching? Uh, is teaching a profession that gets the respect? that it deserves, do you guys think? Do you guys interact with teachers every day? Is it, um, all that you have now? Um, yeah, I, I don't think teachers get enough credit because <coughs> without teachers, I don't know where we are as a society. I mean, for every Alexander the Great, there's an Aristotle showing him the way, and I think our future leaders are gonna be the people who really take don't take their education for granted and really value it. So I think it's imperative that we allow those employees, because they're not just your educators, they're also employees of your school district, to have collective bargaining rights, to be able to have strikes, to um, do what they need to do to be able to teach you most effectively and to maintain a decent standard of living for them. And from, I come from a family of educators, so I think that's very, very important. Jake, do teachers get the respect they do, do you think? I feel like they're very, I feel like this issue is not very overrepresented. I feel like they, uh, it's not very, it's brought more into like the shadows and I feel like this needs to be brought more into the light. I don't may ask you guys, um, how many of you are planning to become teachers? Anybody have anything about uh, being a teacher? I see a few hands. Good. All right, the truth is, um, teachers play, obviously, as I mentioned, uh, we don't have much of a society if we don't have teachers, because they are educating our future generations. And uh, I would hope uh, that uh, you know we bring the best and brightest into teaching professions. Where teaching is acknowledged for the important work it is, almost as important as being a good football player, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, Lily Minor is at the CVU as well. Lily. All right. Um, like I mentioned before. Um, I also wrote mine about climate change, um, mostly focusing on uh, the impact of rising CO2 levels, and I also uh, focused on the fact that we pulled out of the Paris Climate Agreement last year. Um, uh, I sort of, I feel like 
pulling out of that was probably one of the biggest mistakes that have been made so far in this administration just because that agreement put a lot of focus into trying to cut back on the amount of CO2 that we're pushing into the atmosphere and when America is the country that produces the most and we're the ones that are pulling out of the agreement it's sort of um, a big a, a big deal because we're not we're clearly our administration has made it clear that we're not going to stop doing that and the reasoning is um, because of economic setbacks which like I said before should not be put at a higher priority because we can't have a thriving economy when our planet is slowly rejecting us. Good. Um, what should we be doing above and beyond the Paris Climate Treaty? Uh, what should we be doing? What are our states and communities in fact doing in terms of climate change? What are we seeing that's positive? Are we seeing anything that's positive, Zoe? Um, investing in renewable energy sources uh, is really significant. I know that Trump has, in the State of his Union, State of the Union speech, he talked a lot about bringing back clean coal, and I understand that that was a big factor of why his constituents voted for him. But I mean, as Lily talked about, it's not a good idea for the future. It just isn't. Okay. What is if you drive around Vermont? Your parents will know this better than you will. Uh, what do you see now that was not the case 10, 15, 20 years ago? What are you seeing on Route 7? What are you seeing around the state? Um, well, I mean, now, uh, now we're noticing like abundant um, like uh, places where solar panels are prominent. Um, I actually have a neighbor that um, that started a company um, in, in their own area, uh, so in the same center of, or same center of Vermont, um, that uh, where they uh, sell um, these solar panels to people in the area. And of course, this is this is such a, an important source of renewable energy that um, that just I mean harnesses like our natural resources to create a more environmentally conscious government. And of course, you have wind turbines, you have. Um, uh, like, like hydraulic systems and uh, and other things that really support the idea of changing our energy system. Does anybody know how this building is here? Where we are right now in downtown Montpelier? Anyone know? Anyone live here in Montpelier? It's heated uh, a couple of years ago. We worked on this issue. This there is um, right along uh, uh, this street here. There is a large wood burning facility. Uh, and downtown Montpelier is now being uh, heated uh, by wood uh, in, in one of the significant projects, um, downtown projects in the country. So all over the United States, Trump notwithstanding, you're finding communities looking at sustainable forms of energy uh, in terms of solar, wind, wood, uh, hydro, um, hydro uh, geothermal. Uh, and other types of sustainable energy. But it's not just a question of producing sustainable energy. What else do we have to do? What are thoughts on that? Yep. Um, I know that, for example, we have to um, combat the fossil fuel industry, perhaps. And um, I know that Vermont, for example, doesn't have any um, um, fracking sites, I believe. I know that fracked gas is piped through the state, but I know that we're doing at the statewide level our best to combat fossil fuel infrastructure. So. But besides the production of energy, what else can we be doing to conserve energy? Is that an important issue? Anyone know? What are we doing in the state? I'm not sure about here, but I know attempts in the past to uh, save energy, uh, you know, the obviously public awareness initiatives like turn off the light, uh, all those ads you see, but then there are also other things we can do like there's a, a carbon tax that has been proposed and there are things like cap and trade and vehicle emission standards that we can do to try and get our energy use down, but a big part is just making the public aware because in Washington the environmental lobby will never out lobby the coal and the energy uh, fossil fuel lobby. We just have to educate a lot of people about this issue and how we can solve it. Well, one of the things that we are doing 
is we have put a lot of money into weatherization. A lot of homes in Vermont are older homes, and the wind comes whistling in and the heat goes out the window panes or the roof or the doors. So making sure you have a well-insulated uh, home or a building is one way that we can conserve a significant amount of energy. What about transportation? Is that an important issue? What's going on in transportation? What are we beginning to see more and more of? Yep. Okay. Uh, so I just did an environmental impact assessment for one of my science classes, and uh, I was researching airplane emissions, and one of the things that we're really moving towards are biofuels, which is using used vegetable oil to power our uh, airplanes, and we're going to start using that on ground vehicles as well. Um, it's really expensive right now, so it's going to take a long time for it to be accessible, but uh, that's a good Okay, biofuels is one. What else do we have? Yep. Um, I know that we're working to increase the population of electric cars in the state, and I know that it's increased by over like 2,000 within, within the past five years or so. And I know that General Motors and um, Volkswagen and Ford all have plans for um, implementing um, electric cars within our state and nation. Right. That's going to be a radical transformation of energy. You're going to see buses run uh, on batteries, um, and you're going to see more and more hybrid cars and more and more electric cars. And airplanes, I think, are also going to become more fuel efficient. Um, okay, Macy Newbury from Middlebury Union. Macy, what you wrote about? Um, I wrote about uh, healthcare access, specifically for people with mental health challenges and developmental disabilities. Hold that mic a little bit closer again, sorry. <laughs> Um, and uh, I wrote about it because um, I have an older brother who is about to turn 21, and when he turns 21, he, he will no longer be part of a public program, the Counseling Service of Addison County, that has helped him for so long to, um, it's kept him occupied through the day, so my parents have been able to work and not have to worry about um, caring for him constantly, and they've provided him with a lot of care, and we're very, very grateful for them, but once he turns 21, he'll no longer be part of that program, and we're looking for more programs, and we've discovered that there really aren't that many that are affordable or um, close to us. All right. Macy writes about, um, it's a family issue for her, but this is clearly a national issue, not unrelated to opioid addiction. Um, we have a major, major crisis in mental health in this country, uh, and it's an issue that we are not effectively uh, addressing. So who wants to talk more about mental health in particular, or health care in general? Thoughts on that? Maggie, you've been silent for too long. <laughs> Any thoughts on mental health or um, uh, health care in general? Uh. Well, in my town, Woodstock, there's actually a place called uh, Zach's Place, which does cater to some uh, mental disabilities and things like that. And I definitely, my mom's been involved with that for a while. She used to be uh, very involved in that, working there. And I've met a lot of people that that place has really helped, and I definitely think it's a really important it's really important to increase those kind of programs because I've, I've seen how much it helps people. So. It seems to me there are a couple of issues related to what Macy is writing about. Number one, should we look, if somebody breaks their arm or gets cancer, we say, well, that's a health issue, yeah? Should we look at mental health the same way as we look at, at, at that, Macy? Well, I would argue yes. I mean, if someone breaks their arm, or has a I mean, longer standing uh, need for care, such as cancer. Um, they get the care they need provided by, um, and covered by insurance, Tip, I mean, typically if they have insurance, which is a whole other issue. <laughs> um, mental health care is often considered a luxury and therefore not covered by insurance, and it's, it can mean that a lot of people who 
struggle with mental health don't get the help they need, and it ends in, um, I mean, it ends in them not being able to get jobs, and therefore it still can't pay for their health care, and it's kind of a vicious cycle. Amazing reason is a very, very important issue, is that by and large, despite some of our efforts, um, mental health is not considered to be a, a health issue in the way that cancer, for example, would be. But then Macy touches on the second issue in passing, and that is health care in general. Uh, Macy's brother stands the chance to lose the health care that he currently gets. We have 30 million people in this country who have no health insurance and even more who are underinsured with high deductibles and co-payments. What do you guys think we should do with health care in general? Thoughts? Yeah, um, this is actually what thanks. this is what I wrote my essay about. Um, I think that healthcare should be accessible and affordable. Um, I really strongly feel that the health of people is something it's it's almost a right. Um, you it, you should be able to have the care that you need and. I, when I didn't think as much about Maisie's issue until she was speaking, but I have like a little cousin who's on the spectrum and they don't know if they're gonna be able to like live independently when he's older. And I would really hope that past a certain age, we're not forgetting about people who have special needs or need special attention and care. And we would consider for their entire life that they are something that we should take care of. Good. All right, you said you weren't quite sure whether health care should be a right. I think this is not. All right, what do you guys think? Is health care a right or should it not? What do other countries do on this issue? I can tell. Yep. I also wrote my, I also wrote my essay on health care because I do believe that it should be a right because America is the only major country without guaranteed health care. I just think that like, that's a little crazy. Just because, like, that people can die because they can't afford to live. All right, that takes us right to your essay, doesn't it, Jackson? Yeah. <laughs> All right. So elaborate. Uh, is healthcare a right? How do we compare with other major countries? Yeah, like as I said, uh, America is the only country that doesn't guarantee healthcare. So I kind of talked about how um, we should work to make the Affordable Care Act like as affordable as it can be, because um, these other countries are spending a lot less per capita, like almost half as America is and they're still guaranteeing health care, so I just think it's a little absurd, the situation that we have. Okay, anybody here study, uh, saw Jackson study the health care situation? If we took a ride 75 miles north of here, we went up the interstate, and you went into Canada, what's their system like? Would Macy's brother be in the same kind of trouble, you think? Why? What have they done for the last 30 years or so. Mm -hmm. What's their proposition? Their proposition is that health care is in fact a right and that everybody has health care as a right. And when you go to the doctor in Canada, it doesn't cost you anything. It's not a perfect system, it has its problems, but basically it's a very popular program in Canada. Uh, and to get back to Jackson's point, which we don't discuss at all, we are spending, Canada is fairly expensive, we probably spend you know, quite twice as much per capita, but significantly more than they do in Canada. So what I want you to think about, we don't have the time to get into it, is why we spend, in terms of France, for example, I mean, we do spend twice as much per person, and they cover all of their people. Why is that? Why do we pay the highest prices in the world for prescription drugs, okay? Very important issue. It has a lot to do with drug companies, insurance companies, the nature of our healthcare system. And Jackson, thanks for you touching on a very, very important issue. Uh, Hope uh, Petrero. Hope, yeah. uh, I wrote my essay about voter suppression, specifically money and politics, and how the bipartisan campaign reform act has slowly deteriorated over the past few years, and um, court rulings such as um, Citizens United, as well, which um, of produced super PACs and um, minimize public campaign financing are just a threat to our democracy. And I believe that 
Um, it's a multi-partisan issue, which is why I wanted to write about it, because it encompasses all of these issues, because I think that our politicians should accurately represent the views of our nation and not just the select few who have the money and therefore the power. So, um, hope if candidate X is able to establish a super fund, a, a super PAC, and receive millions and millions of dollars from a handful of very wealthy people. Okay, do you think that that is appropriate? Um, I believe that there should be donation limits that are set because I think that um, we minimize other the opinions of those and influence <coughs> those who don't have as much um, funding wise. And Thoughts on Citizens United and our campaign finance system. Is that significant or is it kind of boring? <laughs> no. um, I think this issue is definitely like a large part of um, our country because by allowing specific candidates to gain so much funding through these super PACs um, kind of suppresses the min minority and allows for people of specific demographics to not have their opinion shared and I think that's detrimental to the values of our country. And if your family is going to put $100 million into the coming election? No. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, that is a very, very important uh, issue, Hope, because it, it touches on every other issue. Because if individual get, individuals get elected who are heavily influenced by very, very wealthy people, then the agenda that they're going to push, obviously, is going to be reflective of the needs of very wealthy people, which is what the tax bill that was passed a couple of months ago was all about. And other issues of concern to people who do not make large contributions, uh, those concerns are not going to be addressed. So it is an issue which impacts every other issue. And that's why it is, to me, one of the most important issues we have to deal with. Uh, Zoe? Um, I'd be kind of circling back, but I wrote about health care, and we definitely in our country have a capitalist free market, and this really strong, like, pull yourself up by your own bootstrap spirit, like, if anybody has equal opportunity to make money and be successful. Um, so there's that sentiment, and then we also have a huge number of people who could work as hard as they possibly could and not get enough money or be able to support their families um, to the extent at which we would obviously like. Um, and we kind of think that these two things can't exist together. We can't have our society where we can have the free market and whatever and we can't have health care and I don't think that that's true. And I think that we should be making healthcare more of a priority because it's really important. This touches on um, a very fundamental issue about the nature of our society. And when you hear, you know, a lot of people think, "Oh, why are these people arguing in Washington all the time? And government shutdowns." A lot of that's to do with exactly that. I mean, there are fundamental, fundamental, fundamental uh, differences of opinion about the nature of American society from a very philosophical perspective. Uh, so Zoe raises some very important issues about the nature of American society. Basically, it comes down to uh, whether we believe that every person is on their own, that uh, what society should do is give you the opportunity to become a billionaire, but you're on your own in terms of your housing, your health care, uh, your education, the air that you breathe, that the government should not be playing a role. And other people have a very different point of role, point of view, who think that human beings are entitled to certain rights, basic rights. So we have a constitution which guarantees you the freedom of religion, the freedom of expression, the freedom of assembly, a lot of freedoms. But it does not talk about economic freedoms. Okay? So you have the freedom of speech, but you don't have the right to health care. What about that, Zoe? And I think that. I mean, obviously the framers probably couldn't have taken into account 
that there would exist a cycle of poverty and difficulties in accumulating wealth for certain um, communities of people and discrimination and wages and there's just so many barriers to a lot of communities of people, especially marginalized identities, I would think, um, in gaining enough money to support their livelihoods. Okay. What about rights? I'm going to get back to that rights. You have in the Constitution freedom of expression. If you wanted to take a, um, a sign and watch in front of this building and say, Bernie Sanders is terrible, you have the constitutional right to do that. You have the right to go to any church, synagogue, mosque you want to go to in the Constitution. What about economic rights? Is that something that we should be thinking about more, Lily? Um, I do think it is. Um, uh, we obviously don't have those, but I think the best thing we can do is use the rights that we have, such as freedom of speech, freedom of expression, and assembly. We can use those things to get those economic rights, and I think that's the best thing we can do right now. Yep. Um, so I think I'm of the opinion that this uh, this divide is you know one that's not easily solved. But I think what a lot of people do is really present a false choice. I mean, Adam Smith, the guy who wrote *The Wealth of Nations*, the first you know capitalist book whatever, also talked about how large, large corporations raised prices to exorbitant levels and how everybody had natural rights. FDR in the 30s said that um, the GI Bill of Rights, oh, that was a little later than that, but he said that we all had the freedom from want and I don't think the capitalist system crashed to the ground and everybody suddenly became indigent third world communists. So I think we have to say as a country, some things we want to be more or less free market, some t things we trust the market to provide, and then some things are right. Some things the state needs to help provide, some things the communities can help provide, and some things are not to be left to the free market. Okay, that, that's a very good point, and in fact, FDR, more than any president, has raised that issue of economic rights. Um, Ethan Schmidt, is it Rodman? Ethan? Where are you? Ethan raises another very, very important issue. So I wrote my essay about gun control. Um, and basically, I tried to provide the perspective that we can minimize the mass shooting epidemic in a rational way instead of going all crazy trying to take away the Second Amendment, which is obviously constitutionally impossible uh, because laws are formed based on the amendments and based on the Constitution, not like laws are based to take away those rights. Um, so effectively, the, the idea that I proposed was that we should regulate the use of semi-automatic semi weapons and bump stocks, which are both used in a multitude of mass shootings across the United States. Um, we've seen examples where, uh, like in the deadliest mass shooting um, in history of our country, uh, in modern history at least, um, that uh, it, it was in Las Vegas last October, and uh, the the gunman was able to buy. Uh, by the way, um, there there were loopholes that he used to buy such weapons in uh, in like, like, like in rapid purchases, but I won't get into that now. But um, effectively, uh, you can apply a, a bump stock to a semi-automatic rifle like an AR-15 to create sort of an automatic hybrid uh, of a weapon that is, is capable of shooting rounds of bullets at one time. And of course, this is such an important issue because so many innocent lives are being lost and so many goals and ideas and futures of children are just being uh, wiped off our, our earth because uh, of people that are able to use these dangerous, and, uh, and quite frankly, they're just meant for either recreational use or assault weapons that uh, are used to just kill so many innocent people. So uh, I, I just sort of um, said that instead of taking away people's right to hunt or, uh, or have a right to self-defense, we can sort of take away the weapons that are used most in the mass shootings. Okay, thank you, Ethan. Uh, this is a very contentious issue uh, in American politics. Uh, people uh, agree with uh, Ethan? Or you've been quiet for a while. Do you have views on this one? 
Well, I think that um, although there is an issue with the number of guns in our country, I think that it ties back to being a mental health problem. And I think that that also ties into like the opioid epi epidemic. And I just think that if um, health, mental health was treated the same, then issues like this, um, terrible, tragic things wouldn't happen because people would be able to get the care that they need. That's a very, that's a very important point. Okay, on guns. People agree with Ethan, not agree with Ethan. What's the other side of the story? Who wants to give us the NRA position on this thing? Yep, Lillian, do you wanna? Um, I think people are just, more than anything, it's they just feel as their rights are being um, taken away from them. And I feel like it has less to do with the guns themselves. I mean, I'm obviously NRA and those people, it is about their guns, but I think for a lot of people that aren't necessarily like like lifetime hunters and people that use it all the time, they still have these super strong opinions on it because they feel as their rights are being taken away and they're just, it's more of a defensive position and for a large population, I think that's more what it's about. Good. Further discussion? Yep. Um. Well, I think a lot of the uh, arguments for gun control come from, I mean, obviously these mass shootings, um, but a lot of um, pro-gun uh, advocates argue that, um, that the root of these shootings aren't um, Americans, they're non-Americans, which is, <laughs> I mean, just not true when you look at the statistics. And so I think that it ends up being sort of this hypocrisy that um, people are anti-terror but pro-gun because but the gun is the root of it. So your point is that the president hasn't made a terrible big deal about the fact that killed God killed 58 people in Las Vegas was white, right? Yes. Um, the truth is, um, uh, Ethan, that uh, probably there is a small minority of people who hold the view that I have the right to own any type of weapon I want. There is a minority of people, I think there's maybe 20%. But most people, including probably the majority of the members of the NRA, understand that it's pretty hard to defend uh, the use of these what are the bumps, marker? Bump stocks. Bump stocks. Yeah, which just allow you to shoot an incredible amount of bullets in a very short period of time. That's clearly designed to kill people. Do it, I so I think you know the vast majority of the American people uh, agree with a ban on those type of things, and in fact on assault weapons and other provisions. But you have a very small, well-funded uh, minority who often exaggerate, don't tell the truth, uh, who have been able to prevent um, legislative action on these issues. So, Ethan, thanks very much for raising that issue. Uh, Elizabeth uh, Tunsing, is she here? Elizabeth? No, it's not here. Um, Ella Whitman from CBU. Ella? Um, I wrote my essay on the topic of respect, as I feel that that's the main root of so many of these issues that have been brought up here at the table today. Um, specifically, I think that um, respect, or our country lacks so much respect, and that contributes to things like um, uh, the discrimination of others, as um, the discussion of gay rights has been brought up, and also gender equality. As we've seen so many women come forward, um, from sexual abuse, and I think that goes back to the lack of respect we have for one another and the re lack of respect that we have for human life in our country. Um, also going off that, I feel that we also must not only respect one another and each other's opinions, especially in politics, but, expect, but respect the place that we live in, which also ties back to people who brought up um, environmental issues and as Lily was talking about the CO2 emissions, we must respect the earth we live on and the place that we are given to live. So you see the key issue is respect for people, respect for the environment. Yes. OK. 
Thank you. Who wants to elaborate on that? What's, is that a fundamental principle? Respect. Yep. I think that kind of goes back to like what I was getting at in my part about healthcare, just like how the fact that we put like money over these people's lives is like kind of crazy to me. So I think like if we need to start like focusing more on the community and on like the country as a whole rather than like individual gain, like individual success. Good. Thought on respect. Okay, um, the last essay is from, we think, a young man who um, is in the Burlington School District who is not here, can't be here, because he's incarcerated. Uh, and um, uh, he writes about um, uh, how we have to do a better job uh, in making sure that when people are incarcerated, they get out uh, and they get the support they need so they don't come back in again. We have a very high rate of, um, of folks uh, who leave jail who come back again, uh, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Who wants to talk about, uh, about that? Are we doing a good job in criminal justice? Are we doing a good job in making sure that when people are jailed, when they leave jail, they have the opportunities to start a new life? Yeah. I think it ties back to mental health, honestly, because um, a lot of places in the United States, their uh, resolution to criminals is to kill them and instead of helping them so that they can, you know, uh, develop redemption and to make the, like, turn over a new leaf, basically, in their lives and make their experiences uh, in incarceration or their um, lesson that they learned from making those mistakes into something that they can help other people with. So if we had more support within uh, prisons and when they're, before they even get in there, then I think people would uh, have more of a respect for um, the laws and uh, keeping people safe. This is a, again, like every single essay that all of you wrote, this is again another major, major issue. We have more people in jail than any other country on earth. It's about 1.2 million people, local, state, and federal penitentiaries. We spend about $80 billion a year locking people up. So the question that we have to ask is, why is it that so many people are in jail? What does it have to do with the issues of drugs? You wrote about? Are we doing a good enough job to make sure that when people leave jail, they don't come back again. So a lot of human lives involved in this, and a lot of money involved in this. Any more thoughts on that? Yeah. I know that the private prison industry in America um, really contributes to a lot of this, and as it's developed over the years, it um, has a disproportionately negative impact upon um, communities of color, as well as people who are um, poorer. I know that plea bargaining is, is own um, issue that I can't really get into right now, but I know that um, Vermont has one of the highest um, black incarceration rates in the nation, and I know that in um, all of America, um, black men are, one in three black men will go into go to jail in their lifetime, um, and I feel a lot of this has to do with the fact that um, prisons are for profit. Uh, yeah, Lillian and then Lillian. Um, I think the thing is people are saying, I'm no, I don't want to have to spend my money helping people who got themselves into this situation. That they don't want to spend their money on helping people get with job programs, housing programs, whatever it is, to help people that are leaving jail. It's, it's like, I don't want to have to spend my money on something that you did. But the thing is, if we don't spend that money, they just keep going back into jail and we keep spending more money. So regardless, your money's going there, your tax money, but I think it would be more efficient if we use our tax money to create programs to help right. Lillian raises a good, I mean, <laughs> we can go on for many, many hours on all of your subjects, but Lillian raises a very interesting question. Is our goal, when somebody does something wrong, somebody robs a house, somebody commits an assault, should our goal simply be to punish somebody? All right, you did something wrong, and we're going to put you away for a long time to punish you. 
or should our goal be to say, okay, you did something wrong, and I want to help transform your life so that in the future you don't do something wrong? Should we be motivated by punishment, or should we be motivated by other goals? Yeah, very big issue in this country. Lily? Um, that sort of segues perfectly into the point I was going to make, which is uh, this is sort of uh, aimed at the opi oh, ah, sorry, opioid crisis problems that we're having. Um, I believe that uh, these issues, the people are being sent to jail for these things, it shouldn't be treated as harshly as a crime as it should be a sort of mental or physical illness because we wouldn't, we don't throw people in jail for breaking a bone or having depression and anxiety and these problems that people have, the crimes that people will commit because of the, these drug related issues, it affects them mentally and it affects them physically and they're doing it because they're addicted to something, they're not doing it because they're more morally justifying it and I think that would help just okay. shape the viewpoint. Thoughts? Should we be basing our criminal justice system on it? An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. You do something wrong, we're going to punish you. And that's how it makes you go. Oh. Do you want to? No, I was saying I think there are people over there. Who oh, okay. I'm sorry. Yep. <laughs> so, I, I think obviously there are a lot of legal and administration issues that go into it, but I think those essentially stem from this attitude, which is I think the wrong attitude that we have, the, the point of the law and order segment of the government is to punish people who do bad things, but that's not what it should be for. The point is to make sure that they should not do it again, and that's not just punishment, it's not just a turn, it should also be about trying to change people to make sure that they don't relapse into more criminal activity. Okay. Um, all right, we're winding down. We've gone through all of the essays. I got them all. I <laughs> um, and again, I am um, very impressed. With this, I think. Uh, what do you think, parents? These guys do a good job. <laughs> so, not only have you touched on um, many of the major issues that I deal with every single day in Washington that the American people are wrestling with, people all over the world are wrestling with, you've done it in a very um, intelligent way. Um, all right, before we wind down, is there anything on your minds that we have not gone into? Thoughts or questions? Uh, yeah, I have a question. So, um, what do you think of the uh, budget agreement that was passed last night? I, I mean, I know you were against the uh, increase in the DOD budget and you'd like to see something done with Dreamers, but overall, is it going to help people? Is it good? Yes. Uh, I work, I mean, way politics is. Politics is very, very strange. I work very hard on that agreement. In fact, uh, a lot of what is in it is stuff that a few of us have worked very hard on. Uh, it does things like double the amount of money for childcare in this country, which is a real crisis in Vermont and around the country, puts more money into an issue you guys did not get into, which this bill begins to deal with, is student debt. Uh, we have 40 plus million people in this country who leave college in debt, sometimes deeply in debt in this program, but $4 billion into helping uh, student debt, money into the Veterans Administration, we do put money into community health centers, the issues that I work very, very hard on. So there's a lot in this bill that is good. There are two major issues in it that, and, and I knew, and everybody knew, this was going to end up with 70 plus votes out of 100. So I knew that it was going to pass. The reason I voted against it were two basic reasons. One, a, a reason not a lot of people are talking about this bill increases military spending by $165 billion over a two-year period. That is a huge increase in military spending. And that worries me very much, especially with uh, Mr. Trump as, as president. Um, given all of the crises that we face domestically in this country, whether it's healthcare or education, I thought that that was far, far too much 
for a Department of Defense that cannot do an audit where everybody acknowledges there is massive wastes of money. So I think we need a strong defense, but a $165 billion increase in the two year period was much too much. But I thought it was important that somebody speak out about that issue. And the other issue what, that we did discuss here a little bit is the issue of uh, DACA and the 800,000 or more young people who, if Congress does not act in the next few weeks, will lose their legal status and be subject to deportation. And uh, this bill, our hope had been that we would include that provision in what is called a must-pass bill, uh, where Congress needs budget, had to be. It was not in it. So that, those are the two reasons I voted against it. But there were a lot of good things. Dairy farmers uh, did well in this bill. Uh, um, and, um, but those were the reasons that I voted against it. Okay, let me just thank all of you for your, not only your good essays, but your coming here today uh, and your uh, participation. And I think now, uh, Katarina, we'll get the photographs of the next yeah, part. Yeah, uh, first we'll get a group photo, so maybe the those of you on the side can move to the center and we can stand up, and then we'll present you with your framed essays over here, if you can. Right, the other thing that we did is we took all of your essays and we put them in the congressional record. The congressional record is, in a sense, the history of the United States Congress, coming from, I guess, George Washington on. So your essays will now be part of the history of the United States of America. Yeah. All right, we got it. Good. Okay, now let's go over there and we will. So, uh, since we